All right, in this video, I'm going to cover principal components analysis, or PCA for short, as another algorithm for unsupervised machine learning. Uh, the main purpose of PCA is to reduce dimensionality of the data. But before I go into the details of how PCA works, I should first talk about the curse of dimensionality. Well, in real world, we collect millions of features for every observation. The more is not necessarily always the merrier. Why? Because when you have too many features, when you have too much of information, you're going to face higher computation costs. Your algorithms are going to be more expensive to run, basically. And it's going to be more difficult to find a good solution. Basically, you're going to be adding too much hay in a situation where you, are, you want to find the needle in a haystack, right? So necessarily adding too much data does not help you, especially when that data includes a lot of noise. And finally, it's going to be very difficult to visualize and or interpret the data and the results of your machine learning algorithm. So let's uh, talk with a concrete example about the curse of dimensionality. In uh, the previous videos, I covered how we can use neural networks in order to detect images. Uh, those images were represented in a matrix format and uh, that summarized into uh, 784 uh, features, basically, right? Because each of these pixels represent a particular feature in the data leading to 784 features, right? Uh, and there were many different examples of that. Uh, but when we look at this, we would soon realize that there are a lot of noise here. The very first one is that the pixels that are on the border are always uh, empty. So you see that these uh, pi pixels that are shown in pure black, uh, it is because they are empty, right? So knowing the values uh, is not going to help you that much because they're always black. There's no variation there, right? Knowing that this pixel is black is not going to help you classify this particular image. There's no difference between the value of this pixel between these two pictures, right? Both of them are black, right? That is one of the uh, redundancies in the data. Then the other one is that the nearby pixels are very highly correlated. So if this one is black, the one close by is also black. However, if this one is gray, a particular shade of gray, then the one next to it is also a particular shade of gray, right? So it shows you that even in cases where you don't have that much dimensionality in your data, there are a lot of noise existing and you can use smart ways in order to deal with that noise. Now, let me give you more concrete examples about the curse of dimensionality and why we are worried about uh, dimensionality and why we want to reduce dimensionality. Well, let's suppose that you have one feature, right? X1 is your feature that has values ranging between zero to one. So if you want to figure out the percentage of the outliers in this space in which the outlier is defined as something that is at 1% distance from the border. So any point that is larger than 0.99 or smaller than 0 0.01 is considered an outlier. Well, if you only had one dimension in your data, which is x, and x ranges between 0 and 1, uh, the probability of observing an outlier will be 2%. Why? Because there is 1% outlier towards the left and 1% outlier toward the right, right? Anything that is larger than 99% or smaller than 1% would be outliers. That it is going to be 2%, right? Now, if you increase the number of dimensions to 2, and now you have a two-dimensional plot uh, with the same definition of outliers, right? Anything that is above 99% or less than 9, uh, 1% is to be considered 
an outlier, then all these uh, border areas uh, are going to represent observations that constitute an outlier. And in this case, you can calculate the area covered by the red dots uh, divided by the unit, uh, which is the one unit area of the whole sample, and you soon realize that it is 3.96%. So going from one dimension to two dimension, you would increase the probability of having an outlier from 2% to almost 4%. If you do it uh, with three dimension, and then you'll have a cube uh, with a uh, a unit uh, size for each dimension, uh, you would have about 6% chance of observing an outlier. And those are, you know, all the sides of the cube that you can have, right? So going from one, one dimension to three dimensions uh, very quickly increases the probability of observing an outlier. If you increase the number of dimensions to say 100, you get almost 85% or 90% of observing an outlier. And when the number of dimensions is about 1 million, the probability of having an outlier becomes almost certain. So with 100% probability, you would see an outlier in your data set. Now, why is it that when we increase the number of dimensions, the probability of finding an outlier increases. Well, think about yourself. If I look at the students in a class uh, and only look at one dimension, I may not be able to find an extremist. However, if I start drilling down and look at various dimensions of the personality of the students, then I would be able to find some outliers, some extremists. How many of you add too much sugar to your coffee? How many of you watch too much uh, or play too much uh, video games, right? So on the surface, if I say, all right, outliers based on height, right? I may not find somebody who is seven foot long, right? However, if I just drill down and say, okay, in addition to height, I'm going to look at weight. In addition to weight, I'm going to look at, you know, how much cal calories people consume. In addition to that, I'm going to look at specifically how much sugar they consume. You know, once I do that, I would be able to find an outlier because there is somebody who's having too much sugar in their coffee, right? Now, it gets worse uh, because as you get uh, an increase in the number of dimensions, then the likelihood of having a sparse space increases. Uh, consider the average distance between two randomly selected points in a hyperplane. In this situation, uh, when you only have uh, two dimensions, the average space between two randomly selected observations is almost uh, 0.5. When you have a three-dimensional cube, it becomes 0.66, and when you increase it to a hundred-dimensional hypercube, then the average distance between two randomly chosen points rises to four, as indicated in this graph. Now, why is that happening? Well, imagine that you and 10 other people are sitting in a 10 by 10 uh, room there is going to be a certain distance between you and any of the other students. Now, if I move you to a much, much, much larger room and ask you to sit wherever you want, basically random assignment to the location, the distance between you and the other students are going to be much larger than the first instance. And what is the problem with that? It is the problem with that is that your uh, testing data will eventually become very different from your training data because the instances in the testing data are going to be much less likely to have been included in the training. In other words, because there's so much space between the observations in the training data, there is a lot of void that is not filled. In other words, the training becomes less efficient and the algorithm becomes less accurate. 
because the number and the probability of the instances that it has not seen in the training phase is going to increase as the dimensions of the data increase. Principal component analysis is an approach to reduce the number of dimensions. And the way that it works is by identifying the axis that accounts for the largest amount of variation in the data. In this example that comes from the hands-on machine learning by Jerome, uh, we have a two-dimensional data set. We have two features, basically, X1 and X2. And the red dots that you see are how they are spread out. Well, if I implement the principal component analysis, it will find the uh, new axis or the new component for me called C1, which explains a very large variation in my data set. And then if I project each observation on the C1 axis, I would be able to describe a very large variation in my data set with only one component, the component of C1, rather than the previous two features, X1 and X2. Now, if I wanted to increase the number of components from 1 to 2, then the PCA will find the next component as C2, which is orthogonal to my C1. And you can see that with C2, the variation that would be explained in the data is much smaller, because imagine that you're mirroring every point on C2, you're projecting everything on C2, and a lot of points are going to be overlaid on top of each other, so the variation is going to be much smaller. Now, if I wanted to increase the number of components, then every new component would be orthogonal to the previous uh, components. So in this example, this is the variation that is going to be explained by C1, and as you can imagine, this is how the observations in the original data set would be projected on C1. This is how they would have been projected on C2. And if you had a third component with this line, this is how they would have been projected. Principal component analysis works based on this singular value decomposition concept or mathematical trick that works essentially like a magic. And single, singular value decomposition, or SVD, which is the basis of many different machine learning algorithms, especially unsupervised ones, works like this. It's a, it basically shows that for every matrix, say M, that has M rows and N columns, you can decompose it to three unique matrices uh, known as U, Sigma, and V transpose. The interesting thing is that the number of rows in U is going to be equal to M, but you're going to have R columns, and R is basically the components that you want to uh, have in your data set. So you decide about how many components you want, and based on that, you're going to have a matrix, uh, which is sigma, and the values on the diagonal are going to be uh, non-zero, whereas everything else is going to be zero in this matrix. And finally, you're going to have a V transpose that is going to have R rows equal to the number of components and N uh, columns equal to the number of features in the original data set. Here is an example of how this looks. Suppose that you have an original matrix that has six rows and uh, five columns. So these are, say, six individuals and five features about any of those individuals. If you wanted to create uh, four components uh, and apply singular value decomposition uh, with uh, four components, you would end up with a sigma matrix that has four uh, rows and four columns. Everything is zero except the ones on the diagonal, and the values of the uh, each cell on the diagonal represents the importance, or in other words, the variation that is explained through that component in the data set. So the first one is the most important one, then the second one, third one, and so forth. So in this case, uh, the first one is way more significant and explains way more variation in the data set than the last one. All right? Now, look at matrix U. It also has six rows representing the features, but it has 
four components rather than, or four uh, columns rather than the original five columns. Each of the rows represents the projection of the observations on the new axis, on the new four axis that were created by the principal component analysis for us. Basically, the transformation of the original observation from a five-dimensional space into a new four-dimensional space. So these are the corresponding dimensions in a four-dimensional space uh, that explains the highest possible variation in our data set. Here is, is another example, but this time visually. Suppose that, again, you have this original data set. You have x1 and x2. Each point has a corresponding uh, value for the features x1 and x2 or dimensions x1 and x2. Okay, uh, If you do the... Uh, Single, singular value decomposition, you're going to have a U matrix, which again is going to have two features because uh, the singular value decomposition that we did specified two components, right? Uh, so R is equal to as the number of components that we have. Uh, these new U1 and U2 dimensions for each point represents the projected dimension, sorry, the projected value of each point on each of the new dimensions. More importantly, you're going to have uh, certain values for your uh, sigma matrix. And as you can see here, uh, this is a bar chart that represented for the first component, you have a value of uh, about 35, whereas for the first, second one, you have a value of about uh, 5. And it is, uh, uh, you know, no surprise that you have this because when you look at your original data, you see that the principal component analysis or the, uh, is going to create two uh, vectors for you, you know, two um, axes for you. The first one is going to be along uh, this line. And it's going to explain a lot of variation in your data because once you start projecting these points on that axis, you're going to cover a lot of range from here all the way to here. Whereas the second component, which is going to be uh, orthogonal to the first component, is going to cover a range between you know, right here all the way to here, you know. That is the range that it's going to cover. In other words, much less variation in your data is going to be explained by the second component. 